Hi there, welcome back to another IB Economics Lantern video. Today we're going to be continuing on the topic that we talked about last video, which was price elasticity of demand. We covered about half of what the syllabus has on PED last video, and we'll finish up the rest of what the syllabus has today. In the last video, we defined what elasticity was, how we calculated it, and also what the difference between being elastic and inelastic means. If you have any questions about that at all, go back and watch the previous video, as we'll be building on the knowledge that we consolidated in the last video today. The next thing we're going to look at is what are some characteristics of goods that might give it especially elastic or inelastic demand? And the IB actually breaks the, this up into four main characteristics, four things that we can look at to determine how elastic a good might be. And they are, number one, the closeness and availability of substitutes. Number two, if it's a luxury or a necessity. Number three, the amount of time that we're looking at. And number four, the proportion of income that's spent on the good. We'll break each one of these down individually and determine how this might affect the elasticity of the good that we're looking at. Let's start by looking at the availability of substitutes. So take, for example, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has a close substitute in Pepsi, right, on other soda brands as well. So suppose that the price for Coca-Cola increases. What do you expect would happen to the quantity demanded of Coca-Cola? Remember, when we're looking at price elasticity of demand, we're examining if the price of a good changes, what happens to its quantity demanded, right? So suppose the price of Coca-Cola increases. What would happen to the quantity demanded? Well. The theory is that because Coca-Cola has such a close substitute in Pepsi, consumers could just switch their consumption from Coca-Cola to Pepsi when Coca-Cola becomes more expensive. So what would happen to the quantity demanded of Coca-Cola? Well, it would decrease. How would we show this on a graph? Well, over here we see that if a good has many substitutes, suppose the price is low, maybe somewhere over here, we would have quite a high quantity demanded. Whereas when the price is increased, we might drastically drop that quantity demanded. So a good with many substitutes will have a demand curve that's quite flat, or as we would call it, elastic, right? Suppose we're looking at a good that has few substitutes on the other hand. Well, if the price of that good increases, then consumers don't have the same option of switching to, for example, Pepsi. So what would happen? Well, the quantity demanded would stay almost the same. So we would end up with a much more inelastic demand curve, meaning no matter what the price is, the quantity demanded will stay almost the same. The second characteristic that we're going to look at, which might determine the elasticity of a demand curve, is if a good is considered a luxury or a necessity. Suppose we're looking at the price of a car, a fancy car at that, so perhaps a Ferrari, let's say. If the price of a Ferrari increases, do you think the quantity demanded, the amount of Ferraris bought, would stay the same? Probably not. Because if a Ferrari becomes more expensive, it's not like anyone needs to buy that Ferrari on that specific day. So maybe consumers would hold off on buying that Ferrari or maybe just buy something else instead. So an increase in the price of Ferrari will probably lead to quite a, quite a large will probably lead to quite a large decrease in the quantity demanded. So we say that luxuries typically have very elastic demand. On the other hand, necessities like medication that's needed for survival, let's say. Well, if the price of that medication increases, people don't have the option to stop buying it. They need it for their survival. So even with a price increase, the quantity demanded will stay almost the exact same. Now, how do we show that? Well, of course, with an inelastic demand curve. No matter what the price is, the quantity demanded stays relatively similar. The third characteristic that we're going to look at that might determine the elasticity of a demand curve is the amount of time that we're looking at. I always give an example that suppose you're driving to school one morning and um, you're running out of fuel. You need to fuel up and you notice that, hey, the, the price of fuel has doubled. Well, on that day, do you really have the option of not buying that fuel, even though it's much more expensive? Well, not really. In case you want to get to class on time, you're going to have to take that hit and still pay 
and still pay for that fuel. So in a short time frame, even though the price has doubled, your quantity is staying almost the exact same. So in a short amount of time, you have quite inelastic demand. However, over the course of the following weeks, if the price of fuel remains high, you have the option of switching your behavior, switching your consumption behavior. You could instead take the bus to school. You could bike to school. You could get an electric car, let's say, that doesn't need that much fuel. So in the longer time frame, you can reduce your consumption of fuel. So your demand in the longer run would be much more elastic. You would have much more elastic demand for fuel as we're looking at a longer time frame, And that's true for most goods. As we give consumers time to change their consumption behavior, their demand becomes more elastic. The fourth and last characteristic that we're gonna look at, which might determine the elasticity of demand curve, is the proportion of income that's spent on the good. Let's take a newspaper as an example. A newspaper might cost a dollar. Suppose someone of extremely low income wants to buy this new newspaper. Maybe they only make $5 a day. Well, then this newspaper represents 20% of their overall income, a very high proportion of their overall income. Well, suppose that this newspaper now increases in price from $1 to $2. Now that good represents 40% of this low income person's income, two out of their $5. What do you think this person is gonna do? Will they keep on buying this newspaper? Even though it only increased by $1 in monetary terms, it now represents an extremely high proportion of their income. So will they continue buying the newspaper? Most likely not. So if a good represents a high proportion of your income, you're typically gonna have more elastic demand for that good. However, if the good represents a very small proportion of your income, so suppose we take the same newspaper that's going from $1 to $2, but instead of this low income person, we have an extremely high income person wanting to buy it. Someone who makes $100,000 a year, let's say. Well, for this person, the increase in price of the newspaper doesn't represent a large proportion of their overall income. It, rep rep it represents a very low proportion of their overall income. So even if the newspaper is increasing in price, that's not going to massively affect their consumption behavior. So despite the price increase, we might see a very inelastic demand, meaning that this high income earner for which the good represents a low proportion of their overall income, they'll continue buying about the same amount of newspapers because it's just a drop in the bucket. So using these four characteristics, we can hypothesize the elasticity of basically any good. Take cigarettes, for example. Would we expect the demand for cigarettes to be elastic or inelastic? Take a look at these characteristics for a second. What would we assume? Well, I would say that cigarettes are definitely an example of a necessity. Why? Because those people who smoke cigarettes are typically addicted to them. So it becomes a necessity in their life. Now, what did we say? Well, when a good is a necessity, you're gonna have more inelastic demand. Why is that? Because even if the price changes, you're going to continue buying the same amount. So make sure that you memorize these four characteristics and you'll be able to take essentially any good that the IB might throw at you and hypothesize whether its demand might be more elastic or might be more inelastic. The last couple of things that we need to learn about in order to wrap up our understanding of price elasticity of demand is how to calculate the PED between two points on a curve. Here we see a graph where I've set up two points, point A at which the price is eight and the quantity demand is one, and point B, where the price is seven and the quantity demanded is two. Now, we want to be able to calculate what is the PED of this line as we move from the price of eight to the price of seven. Now, although maths isn't usually a large part of the SL syllabus, this calculation is still on both the SL and HL syllabus to make sure that you're comfortable with doing these calculations no matter what level you're taking IB economics at. If you remember from our last video, we can estimate the PED by this equation. The PED equals the percentage change in quantity demanded over the percentage change in price. 
So how do we take these numbers from the graph and plug them into this equation? Well, we need one more step. We need to be able to solve for the percentage change of quantity demanded and the percentage change in price. Now, how do we do that? Well, to find the percentage change of anything, we take the new value minus the old value divided by the old value times 100. Let's see how that works in action. So given this example, when the price is changing from eight to seven, and therefore the quantity demanded is changing from one to two, let's calculate both the percentage change in price and percentage change in quantity demanded. So the percentage change in quantity demanded, we'd find by the new quantity demanded, which is two, minus the old quantity demanded, one, divided by the old quantity demanded, one times 100. When we do this calculation, we'll get one divided by one times 100. So the percentage change in quantity demanded turns out to be 100%. We can do the same for the percentage change in price. The percentage change in price we'd find by the new price minus the old price divided by the old price times 100. The new price is seven. The old price is eight divided by the old price, which is eight times 100. And when we simplify this, we're going to get negative one over eight times 100, which when worked out, we'll get negative 12.5%. And that's our percentage change in price. Now we can just take these two values and plug them in to our formula for PED. So PED equals percentage change in quantity demanded over percentage change in price. Let's substitute in our values. 100% divided by negative 12.5%. We can plug that into our calculator and what we're going to get is that PED is equal to negative eight. So that's as easy as it is. That's our calculation for PED. If you're ever asked to calculate the PED between two points, all you need to remember are those two formulas, the formula for the PED and how to find the percentage change of quantity demanded and the percentage change of price. Now, thinking back to our definitions of elastic and inelastic demand, we can deduce that in this region, when the price is moving from eight to seven, this graph has elastic demand. Why is that? Because the value of eight is greater than one. Any value greater than one means that you have elastic demand and less than one means that you have inelastic demand. The last topic that we need to be comfortable with which is quite a higher level topic. Although it exists on both syllabi, it's very rarely asked about on the SL questions, but we do need to make sure that we know it. This last topic is explaining why along a straight line demand curve, such as the one that I've drawn here, the elasticity isn't constant. So with a straight line demand curve like this, we can deduce that the slope is constant all the way down. That's one of the first things we learn in math, right? A straight line has the same slope all the way down. But elasticity isn't the exact same thing as slope. Although they might be related, because they're calculated in a slightly different way, we're not able to say that, hey, a steep line necessarily has inelastic demand or a flat line has elastic demand. We need to do a bit of calculation in order to determine the elasticity. Specifically, the most important lesson that we need to learn from this is that any straight line demand curve, such as the one I've drawn here, has what we call decreasing elasticity along the demand curve. The elasticity decreases as we go down the curve. So any straight line demand curve such as this one will start off by being slightly more elastic and as we go down the curve will become more inelastic. Now let me show you an example as to why that's the case. So let's take this same demand curve. Remember in this top left region where we've already calculated the elasticity, we found that the demand was elastic as we ended up with a value of negative eight. Suppose instead we look at if the price changes from one to two, and in response, the quantity demanded changes from eight to seven. So down here in the bottom right. Well, if we follow the exact same steps as we did when, well, if we follow the exact same steps as when we were calculating the PED up in the top left region, then we're actually going to find that here in the bottom right, the PED is going to be equal to negative one eighth. 
Negative one eighth is definitely less than one, right? So we're gonna have inelastic demand. Now, how can that be? How can it be that with a straight demand curve, straight line demand curve, it's elastic in the top left region and inelastic in the bottom right region? Well, remember that with PED, we're not calculating the absolute changes. By using this percentage change, percentage change in quantity demanded and percentage change in price, we're calculating what's called relative changes. And just by the nature of how the math pans out, we'll end up with having more inelastic demand in the bottom right and elastic in the bottom left. So we could write up here that we'll have elastic somewhere up here with a PED that will be greater than one. Remember PED, the absolute value and inelastic down here where the absolute value of PED will be less than one. Now that's all for this video. Remember what we've covered. We covered the four characteristics that we need to look at to determine whether a good has elastic or inelastic demand. We also looked at how to calculate the PED and then the slightly more difficult concept of today's video explaining why a straight line demand curve has what we call decreasing elasticity. The elasticity becomes more inelastic as we move down the demand curve, even with a straight line demand curve. Next video, we're going to be finishing up talking about PED and its applications into calculating things like total revenue. So stay tuned for that.